Namaste and greetings. I, Anjul Karnani, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, where policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a distinguished lecture on the 15th Finance Commission and Disaster Risk Management by Sri N.K. Singh. This deliberation is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, and IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. The esteemed speaker for the distinguished lecture will be Sri N.K. Singh, prominent Indian economist, academician, and policy maker and chairman, 15th Finance Commission. Mr. Singh is also a published author with several prominent books to his name, Politics of Change, An Insight into India's Politics and Economy, provides incisive insights into the realities of coalition politics and international fault lines. Not by reason alone, comments on the past and present of the politics of change and the new Bihar rekindling governance and development is a collection of perspective essays on the Bihar model of development. His autobiography, Portraits of Power, Half a Century of Being at Ringside, was published in 2020. His latest book, Recalibrate Changing Paradigms, is a compilation of essays written in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic on a wide range of subjects, including fiscal policy, federalism, health, education, geopolitics and climate change, to mention a few. He has been a reputed columnist in leading newspapers, including the likes of Hindustan Times, Hindustan, the Indian Express, the Hindu, and Mint. As the patron, we have Sri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM, New Delhi for the session. And as the convenience for this discussion, we have Professor Anil K. Gupta, Head, ECDRM, NIDM, New Delhi. Tikendra Singh Pawar, former Deputy Mayor, Shimla, Visiting Senior Fellow at IMPRI, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI, and Dr. Somnadeep Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Vishwa Bharti Shanti Niketan, Visiting Senior Fellow at IMPRI, New Delhi. Now, I would like to inv invite our conveyor, Professor Anil Gupta, for his opening remarks and to invite Sri N.K. Singh for his lecture and proceed further. We look forward to hearing from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Hello. Okay, you are audible. Uh, thank you, uh, Anchal and other colleagues from IMPRI. And, uh, First of all, my uh, sincere gratitude and thanks to uh, Professor N.K. Singh, sir, for having consented and been able to spare his valuable time to address on very uh, important aspect, that is the DRR-related uh, financial provisions under the 15th Finance Commission. That is the transition from the response fund to uh, risk mitigation fund for disaster management. Uh, I would also extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Arjun and Dr. Simi, uh, who are leading IMPRI to this very important journey of generating knowledge on various dimensions of the uh, development and the, the, the discourses towards uh, the, the implementation of SDGs along with disaster risk reduction. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Shweta Bede and others are also here. Uh, uh, Professor N.K. Singh Saab, who has been the chief architect and I would say the chief guide uh, as the chairperson of the 15th Finance Commission, has uh, uh, been able to bring a phenomenal change in the country. And basically now, now each and every dimension of disaster risk management, we are finding a huge uh, I would say that a plethora of opportunities uh, for this paradigm shift in disaster management that we have been talking about for almost uh, 20, 20 years or uh, two decades, that the adequate emphasis has to be now 
on pre-disaster uh, activities rather than only post-disaster relief and response. However, everything boils down to economics. So resources are the real issues, and more particularly, the, the, the financial provisions in terms of National Disaster Response Fund and National and the State Disaster Response Fund, the SDRF and NDRF, the two main vehicles for providing financial assistance to various states and UTs in the country for various interventions. However, those were primarily limited to response and relief. Uh, disaster management legislation of India also provided uh, a need for having a disaster mitigation fund. So mitigation is primarily uh, a gamut of activities pre-disaster that includes the understanding risk that includes preparing for uh, meeting with disaster situations, capacity building, and so many other dimensions that we, we are in a better position to count, take counter disaster measures. But the resources were the real issues. And this 15th Finance Commission report has really brought a, I would say that this kind of phenomenal uh, change. Uh, now, uh, within, within National Disaster Management Authority, NDMA, NIDM, and Ministry of Home Affairs, we are now working rigorously that how we help various states and various other sectoral ministries in operationalizing these provisions by developing guidelines, by developing now specific guidelines for each disasters also. For example, now there is a provision for drought proofing activities. So where are the gap areas done by Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water Resources and others? So where we can we use some amount from this money that we call it now National Disaster Risk Management Fund or National Disaster Management Fund instead of Disaster Response Fund only. So I think that is a, that is a huge opportunity. Now, all the states have adequate money available for in undertaking various activities for capacity building, training, research, awareness kind of things also. And then also the provision for under undertaking various initiatives for risk transfer mechanism. Uh, that, um, maybe in other terms, we can say the promoting risk finance. So I think that is also another big opportunity being promoted by the, uh, by, by the, uh, the 15th Finance Commission. So I would not be speaking for quite long. And really, I am feeling blessed and I am feeling uh, pride uh, having uh, the opportunity of being able to listen to uh, N.K. Singh Saab uh, by himself. We have been quoting his work. We have been quoting his report at several places. We have been uh, 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 having several discourses. Now, this is an opportunity that uh, we and our colleagues will listen the, 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 the key uh, thought process behind the 15th Finance Commission brought this phenomenal change from himself. So this is a great opportunity. Welcome you, sir, from NIDM, from NDMA, from IMPRI, and all the sector that is contributing in the area of disaster risk management. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I would request Ms. Achal to kindly invite sir for his deliberation. Achal, would you like to? Yes, uh, so can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, should I? Should I? Should yes, I? Should I would I like to invite. Yeah. 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 We I invite, would like sir. to invite Shri. Yes. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Anchal. Uh, thank you, Professor Gupta for uh, that introduction, which I thought that uh, was a succinct summary or some of the broad features of the 15th Finance Commission. I'm indeed grateful to the National Institute of Disaster, Ministry of Home Affairs, and the Impact and Policy Research Institute for this opportunity to speak on the broad theme of the 15th Finance Commission and disaster risk management. Indeed, as a chair of the 15th Finance Commission, disaster management was one of the issues to which we devoted high priority. This emanated from several factors. The most proximate ones were the recent experience of the intensity of such disasters increasing at an unprecedented pace. Furthermore, the concept and meaning of disaster has somewhat metamorphosed over time. In the popular psyche, 
disasters were associated in the past with mainly natural disasters of typhoons, cyclones, with economic and social consequences. Over a period of time, there has been somewhat broadened approach to include epidemics, pandemics, and even colossal failure of agriculture with cropping patterns. The 15th Finance Commission had one of the broadest terms of reference in recent times. In a disaster, it specifically asked the Commission to review the present arrangements of disaster management initiatives with reference to funds constituted under the Disaster Management Act of 2005 and make appropriate recommendations. We were requested to consider proposing measurable performance incentives for states at an appropriate level of government. The 15th Finance Commission submitted, as you know, two reports one for the period 2021, the final report covered a five-year period of 2021 to 2026. So really speaking, this was a slight departure from the normal pattern of finance commission that our awards covered a six-year period than a five-year period. In the context of the finance commission's recommendations, we were, and subsequent to that, there have been subsequent important changes. First, the impact of global warming and climate change, which is the most proximate area of concern, the need to strengthen institutional arrangements of both the National Disaster Management Authority, the NDMA, and the State Disaster Management Authorities, SDMA, and the need to review the Disaster Management Act, particularly in the context of the COVID-19. With such events, invariably reliance was placed in the past on the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897. Epidemics and pandemics are not specifically covered in the seventh schedule of the Constitution, except related to broader subjects like public health as an entry in the state list, while preventing the spread of diseases from one state to another, which is in the concurrent list. These need greater recalibration in my view. Indeed, the second Administrative Reforms Commission in 2006, and even earlier, the National to review the working of the Constitution in 2002, had suggested a similar review of the National Disaster Management Act. There was also the issue of the need for the insurance industry to cover not only disasters, but also households and the corporate sector. We also factored the need for conformity to India's obligations as signatory to three large global frameworks, which were created in 2015, namely the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the Sendai Frame. Framework called for a need to reset interrelated action on the part of the government to strengthen mitigation, to cover all stakeholders, mitigation, adaptation, strengthening of regulation, risk reduction, vulnerabilities, and build greater resilience at the level of state and civil society. Furthermore, in relation to combating climate change, India has launched eight months under the National Action Plan on Climate Change, the NAPCC, in specific areas of solar energy, energy efficiency, water, agriculture, the Himalayan ecosystem, sustainable habitat, green India, and strategic knowledge on climate change. Climate action, the climate action in the state level are based on state action plans. The union government is also implementing the National Adaptation Fund 
for climate chance to support adaptation measures. It has embarked simultaneously on ambitious action in the area of renewable energy, air forestation, energy efficiency, and urban development. As a result of these efforts and endeavors, India has achieved a reduction in the carbon emission of 21% of the GDP between 2005 and 15, achieving its pre-2020 voluntary goal of reducing energy intensity by 25% from 2005 by levels up to 2020. As per the nationally determined contribution, India now stands committed to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030. The 15th Finance Commission, based on national and international practices, was guided by four principles. First, in all countries with the federal system, central or federal governments provide disaster assistance while primary responsibility or disaster management rests with the state. In India too, the union government is responsible for providing assistance to the states through the National Disaster Relief Fund, while the state disaster relief fund and other transfers. In view of its long evolution, legal status and operational utility, the State Disaster Relief Fund should continue as a principal vehicle for state resources for disaster management. Second, disaster management consists of a cycle of several functions, namely prevention, preparedness, response, mitigation, recovery, and reconstruction. However, as it evolves and changes, the cycle of advocates also function and change. The Commission therefore acknowledged for different functions covering both relief and mitigation, the creation of National Disaster Risk Management Fund and the State Disaster Risk Management Funds. Third, the Union Government's fiscal space for disaster management at the national level has reduced significantly after subsuming a substantial amount of the National Calamity Contingency Due Fund into GST and the creation of NDMF and SDMF. Thus, the 14th Finance Commission recommended a change in the financing pattern of SDRF by the Union and the states, a ratio of 90-10 for all states, which was accepted by the government. However, since the GST has not stabilized and had not stabilized then, since its introduction in 2017, the union government reverted to the previous ratio calculated by the 13th Finance Commission, namely 25% contribution by all states, except Northeastern and Himalayan states doing 10%. This was an arrangement which we also considered appropriate. Fourth, the financial services and instruments for disaster management needs to be diversified. Even though public funds serve as an important purpose, in providing predictable support to states, these are seldom sufficient. Thus, we recognized the importance of alternative sources of funding and the role of market instruments and risk management. The core recommendations made by the 15th Finance Commission included, one, that the ratio of contribution by union and the states to the state level allocation for disaster management recommended by the 15th, 13th Finance Commission may be maintained. Two, mitigation funds should be set up both at national and state levels in line with the provisions of the disaster management fund. Third, the allocation of disaster management to SDRMF should be based on factors of past expenditure, area, population, disaster risk index, which reflects the state's institutional capacity, risk exposure, hazard, and vulnerability. Fourth, the total state's allocation to SDRMF should be subdivided into funding windows that encompass the full disaster management cycle. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Gupta, you mentioned this, that we had the opportunity really of looking at disaster in a certain holistic way. And that is why we wanted 
to subdivide this into different windows and which is what we succeeded in doing. 80% going to, uh, to be SDRF should be further distributed to 40% for relief and response, 30% for recovery and reconstruction, and 10% for preparedness and capacity building. Fifth, the allocation for SDRMF should be based on expenditure of the previous years. Sixth, the allocation for SDRMF should be subdivided into funding windows similar to all the states for allocation or disaster management. Seventh, to discourage excessive and unsubstantiated demands from the states, all central assistance through the NDRF and the NDMF should be provided on a graded cost sharing basis. The states contributing 10% for assistance up to 250 crores, 20% for assistance up to 500 crores, and 25% for assistance beyond 500 crores. Eighth, that a recovery and reconstruction facility should be set up within NDRF and SDRF. Ninth, that the state governments need to have essential disaster preparedness to respond effectively to disasters. These institutions and their institutional capability must be equipped and well functioned. Tenth, that major capital works required for proper upstream river basin management and to mitigate annual floods with gestation period of 10 to 15 years cannot be accommodated to the function of the wards because such projects should be considered a national priority projects. 11, there should be six year mark allocations for a total of 11,950 crores for certain priority areas as well, including expansion and modernization of fire services, resettlement of displaced people affected by erosion, and also under the, and four under the NDMF, the catalytic assistance of 12 most drought prone states, managing seismic and landslide risks in 10 hill states, reducing the risk of urban flooding in seven most populous cities, and mitigation measures to prevent erosion. Twelfth, a streamlined system of payment by the Ministry of Home Affairs to the Ministry of Defense should be institutionalized through mutual consultations. We outlined some options in this regard. In order to, 13th, in order to strengthen institutional capabilities, a dedicated capacity should be set up to supervise NDRMF and SDRMF to augment disaster funding through other sources. 14, to improve and streamline the access to central assistance to states. All the new funding windows, 15, need to be supported through development guidelines or drawing up of such should be led by NDMF. An annual report at the national level may record all the allocation, expenditure, key achievements, and results against various indicators. The government in the action taken report, 18th, and not unimportantly, insurance mechanisms, which act as a social safety net, must supplement financial mechanisms need to be introduced in partnership with insurance companies after due diligence has been done. The government in its action taken report fully accepted the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission and its implementation is currently underway. Since the submission of the 15th Finance Commission, there have been multiplicity of changes which we need to recognize. What therefore is a path forward? It is now clear that we need, as Professor Anil Vij said, to take a holistic view, not only on natural disasters, but factors contributing to global warming and climate change. Disasters have occurred from the beginning of civilization in multiple forms. In contemporary times, however, boundaries of nations have got increasingly obliterated 
both by the power of technology and by exogenous events overtaking endogenous action. They move forward, therefore, what are some of the key challenges which we face? First and foremost, as Professor Gupta rightly pointed out, the challenge of the paucity of financial resources. The Economist, in its most recent issue, while writing on the area of renewable energy, has highlighted that India alone needs $500 billion by 2030. How do we finance this? Of course, renewable energy, particularly solar energy, has become even significantly lower than the cost of fossil fuel-based energy. However, we need to accelerate this transition to renewable energy, which involves enormous resources, both by way of enhanced public outlays, as well as partnership in catalyzing private flows. What are therefore the enabling conditions and framework which will allow securing private flows for meeting the financing needs? This is easier said than done because private capital flows will never be driven by philanthropy or compassion, but on calculations in which both the opportunity cost of investment as well as the profitability of such investments would be the primary consideration. Second, it is clear that in any effort to garner private capital flows, multilateral institutions like the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the regional development banks like the Asian Development Bank have critical and important roles to play. We need to recalibrate the charter of the multilateral institutions and accord functioning to action relating some of the matters which I have mentioned above. I see. Bilateral financial commitments, both from G7 and G20 countries, need to be at least doubled on climate change over the next few years. This needs to be matched a massive increase in finances from the multilateral development banks growing at least threefold during the same period. We know that ultimately these banks are owned by shareholders. A mechanical allocation of a mechanical reallocation of quotas based on current relevance and power of member countries of these banks will not be able to give priority to broadening the areas of climate equity. Instead of per capita allocation based on the classic economic factors around the banks, would we be able to change, for instance, the charter of these banks to move to per capita emission as the most important guiding factor? Restructuring the working of multilateral financial institutions have an adequacy of bearing on the adequacy of, of finance for the entire area of climate change. Third, private capital flows in this area will need to hedge their risks. Separate and enhanced windows need to be created in these institutions for risk mitigation to garner private capital flows. These are positive steps, but far beyond the needs of mitigating the risk for private capital flows. International public finance needs to be refocused on de-risking private flows and garnering a larger pool of private capital, which is looking for, for critical areas to invest in sustainable assets. Multilateral development banks should be nudged towards almost entirely shifting to de-risking activities rather than plain vanilla project financing, which tends to crowd out and crowd in private capital. MDBs are also well placed to help build projects and program pipelines for scaling up net zero and resilience investments in the emphasis on supporting local and subnational action. Fourth, in addition to sovereign institutions themselves, what kind of role would banks and central bankers play in catalyzing greater financial outlays to activities connected with disaster and disaster management for adequacy of finance? Fifth, what kind of a restructuring
is what kind of restructuring and climate related actions are necessary for these inst important institutions to receive continuing priority, even as all federal structures and administrative decisions will inevitably be altered by technology. The adoption of newer technologies, the 5G, the fiber optical cables, artificial intelligence, and internet of things, not only enhances the reach and quality of data, but also enables targeting specific action to cover activity, which ranges from agriculture, manufacture, health, education, means of transportation, and conduct of everyday life, which you all know. Fostering and adapting these technological changes is an ongoing but an exciting challenge, which is inescapable. Sixth, it is critical that both national and subnational institutions have become important stakeholders. This recognizes the important role of green public finance at state, regional levels, cities, municipalities, local and village panchayats. Incentivizing these multiple tiers of the governance process to make more sustainable choices would be an important factor to deal with these important priorities. Seventh, the challenge of how to and how do we make regulatory and other changes which will help insurance companies given the flexible policy in relation to foreign investment on insurance that India has adopted. How can they play a more significant role for insurance to cover disasters? Certainly for the corporate sector and beyond that in terms of public properties as well. How do we enhance the reach and role of insurance companies, both for public and both for private goods? Finally, we need domestic and international regulations and legislations. In terms of domestic legislation, the task force constituted by the Ministry of Home Affairs on the 18th of August 2017 presented its report to the former home to the former home minister Rajnath Singh on establishing a coalition on disaster resilient infrastructure on 2nd May 2018. The CDRI was first proposed by Prime Minister Modi during the 2016 Asian Ministerial Conference on disaster risk reduction in New Delhi. It was later conceptualized in the first and second edition of the International Workshop on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure in 2018-19, organized by MDMA in partnership with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Management, the UNDP, the World Bank, and the Global Commission on Adaptation. As of April 2021, 30 members have joined the CDRI, consisting of 23 national governments and seven organizations. At the same time, we need to monitor if international regulatory framework evolves in a manner which is in consonance with the somewhat more visionary national regulation to consistently ensure there is symmetry between national and international action. The needs of disaster management are in a constant flux and the challenges of the world seeks to refocus on the importance of adopting renewable forms of energy. The distractions of the current ongoing war in Europe, the changing geopolitics of the country, the inflationary forces with the recessionary tendencies must be viewed as transient events. The survival of this planet is dependent on coherent action to address the challenges on management in a holistic way. I've sought to outline the issues and the considerations, both in the approach of the 15th Finance Commission, as well as subsequent developments. Some of the challenges I mentioned above need constant recalibration. This is a dynamic context, but the priority to do so is compelling. Indeed, by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail because preparation through education is always less costly 
than learning through tragedy. And there is no harm in hoping for the best as long as you are prepared for the worst. But indeed, we must not be really, because the better to have and not need than to need and not have. We need and revise approach to the entire issue of disaster management. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm sure we have learned a lot. Yes, uh, Professor Anil Gupta, uh, over to you for any questions or remarks Thank you. you may have. Thank you. And, and uh, we will have a little bit of time to take a few questions from participants. So I request the participants to post any questions in the Q&A box. Until then, yes, Professor Gupta, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, enlightening us. Uh, though we have seen the report, but the thought process behind bringing these things in the report uh, that you uh, shared is very important because anything uh, has been put, even a single word or single sentence has been put with a lot of thorough discussions and a lot of consultations uh, that has come up uh, through your deliberation and uh, a very a strategic thought process has been behind that. Uh, sir, now uh, I have just a quick uh, uh, this thing and would like to uh, seek your insight. Sir, actually after we have uh, now adequate provisions for risk reduction activities and pre-disaster activities, uh, now we are finding that uh, the states are still not clear that how do we really uh, put this money for uh, preparedness and capacity building interventions. And uh, uh, some or other way, they lack that capacity uh, to understand and to plan in that way. Response, they were able to do that. Uh, so uh, we, are, uh, we are having this struggle and at NDMA and an IDM, we are trying to work out. We are also trying to come up with a manual and then to sensitize the state, uh, the officials at the state government. So, uh, so uh, would be, would be uh, uh, great to have your uh, guidance for this, sir that how, how can we really uh, help the states and develop their the capacities in the state, uh, the officers in the state to really be able to utilize particularly the mitigation part of it. Response, they were, uh, they were aware, but sir, yes, sir. So if you can uh, give us some light on sir. So I, so, so I think that there are uh, two tangible steps. Uh, one, I think in my view, we have provided in our recommendations some resources directly for capacity building in the states. And this was with the intention of replicating similar institutional arrangements, which we have currently with the central government, with the states as well. And I would really request you to take up this matter with the Ministry of Home Affairs that in the compliance by the states, before receiving the funds of the 15th Finance Commission, the food adherence to capacity building programs do not really uh, get overlooked. So I would really say that building credible institutions at the state level to replicate the kind of institutions which we have now at a national level would be an important step forward. Second, I think that while that will take time, I strongly recommend that uh, the National Institute, along with the IMPRI, take the steps of having some regional seminars and regional programs and regional interaction of the kind which we are having today to enhance their understanding. And education and awareness, I recognize, has, the most, has a very important role to play, which goes well beyond mere response, which you rightly pointed out. So I think there is no getting away. We have provided the money. We have provided the resources. The utilization of these resources need to be monitored and the state governments need to comply uh, with the letter and spirit of the recommendations, which broadly speaking, uh, takes this particular factor into account, Professor Anil Gupta. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very, uh, very, uh... Uh, important uh, guidance from your side. Uh, now I would request uh, the IMPRI team to take a few questions if we have, or if they got any questions. Um, 
are the participants if they have any questions please post them in the q and a box or they can raise or, hands and they can or please raise your hand and ask your question briefly we have a few minutes for question and answer if anyone would like to raise any question Okay. Um, there are no questions at the moment. Uh, Anil, sir, you are on mute. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, uh, this serves guidance that we should uh, hold more such programs at state level or the regional levels. And then we we look at, for example, the, the the cluster of coastal states, cluster of mountain states. I think Sir has clearly given us guidance, and that will be very very useful. Uh, so uh, this has been a very very uh, very very useful uh, deliberation of almost 50 minutes. Sir has another meeting after a few minutes, so uh, he has been so kind to join this deliberation, and uh, we have largely been uh, benefited. In fact, uh, I would seek. Uh, time with sir and would like to meet him soon uh, in person also and then uh, with his guidance we can organize some face to face discussion also sir uh, so that and we we call some states also then we can come up with some kind of a prototype ideas and that will be useful sir so for that so, i will be in touch with you sir so i think professor gupta let me give you an idea uh, why don't you have um, the uh, uh, Certainly, two such meetings uh, covering the, some of the more difficult states. Uh, there was an there was an initiative which I remember, in which uh, in Dehradun uh, I attended an uh, uh, interaction for the hill states and for the northeast states, then convened by the chief minister of uh, uh, Uttarakhand, and there was another which was in the, which the chief minister of Assam, then he was the finance minister of Assam, was very keen to do it for the Northeast state. So definitely these two, given their vulnerabilities you can have. So you can have a series of such programs. Set. And I think that would really, in my view, uh, be serve an enormous value. So what has happened, uh, frankly, is that the context since the 15th Finance Commission, a report has also changed. Some of which I have hinted in my in my comments and my lecture. A lot of changes have taken place. We need to, in the light of factoring these changes, uh, this kind of a face interaction, in my view, would be enormously useful. Also, we must get the media, vernacular media, in the local language, involved very much into understanding some of these, and that will really enable. Uh, the local television channels uh, in the vernacular or in the local regional languages, along with the local newspapers, along with it in terms of a one day you can have really interaction. And I think that would really enable a much greater action to be taken. And that's a step which I'll encourage you to take. Also, I think on this area of capacity building, having state level institutes on the broad issues of disaster management on the lines of what we have, would really is a thought uh, which needs to be encouraged because resources have been provided and the central government has accepted the, our recommendations. And I think that your institution can play an important role Certainly. in being able to monitor and help and encourage the acceptance of those. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you and uh, for your valuable time and your guidance. Certainly we will work a lot accordingly. And uh, we would like to have your time uh, in the future also. And for that, we will be in touch with you so that we can have more insights, uh, not only limited to the 15th Finance Commission, but otherwise also your wide uh, area of uh, expertise. How can we uh, enrich uh, this discipline? That will be a great advantage to us, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing this occasion. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you to the team for organizing this uh, very important. Thank event. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. For a... So, for, uh, for, uh, if you could just wait a minute, sir. For a formal vote of thanks, I would like to invite yeah. our commentary. 
Uh, thank you. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Anshu, researcher at M3 Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally thank our Professor Shri N.K. Singh for his valuable time. And I would like, uh, like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the M3 Center for in Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable, Sustainable Development. In three Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. We would like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Sri N.K. Singh, for taking out this precious time to share his views on the 15th Finance Commission and Disaster Risk Management. And we thank our esteemed patron and convenience, uh, Sri Taj Hassan, Professor Anil K. Gupta, Tikendra Singh Panwa, Dr. Sini Mehta, and Dr. Somadhi Chattopadhyay for adding your diverse perspective and valuable insights to the deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on the Zoom or on the YouTube Live for participating. And we are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. I hope that you continue to tune in to our future Impri Web Policy Talk. And thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.